to you today about building building um, resiliency. And I think it's a term that's often used without context. Uh, I can tell you that my 27 years in local government, uh, I've seen a lot, especially for those of us that have been in this valley prior to the pandemic. Uh, we definitely still have the some scars from the economic downturn that we had that was back in 2008 when we led the nation in foreclosures and we saw the impact of that both personally and economically. And then, as Dr. Barlow said, coming off of COVID and in, in my tenure at the city of Las Vegas, I also had to deal with the, the tragedies of 1 October before the um, unfortunate tragedy that happened on uh, the campus of UNLV. So one of the things that we know is that in our world today, that navigating uncertainty is what we have to do. It's just, it's, you know, we live in a different time and place. There's a lot of polarization. There are just some things that are going on. And being able to have this discussion today, I think is really proactive on the university's part because too often we don't have these types of conversations before it becomes a necessity. And I think that that's really um, uh, something that we need to do more of. Let's see if I... Okay, come on. Now. So we're a little bit, uh, thank you, Dr. Barlow, for the great introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to partner with Dr. Barlow in Intersection. And as uh, Dr. Barlow indicated, uh, myself and my sister have a lot of experience in local government, but then also in community capacity building and just understanding what's going on in our, not only our local community, but in across, you know what's going on across the nation that affects our local community. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the importance of resilience in higher education, strategies for building resilience. Again, we throw out that term, but what does it mean and how do we achieve it? Applying resilience in daily work uh, and then also in your personal life. And then we're gonna take some um, Q and A. So before we get started, we wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself. So if we can, and I, maybe I'll just call on people because it might make it easier in this forum to give us your name, how long you've worked for UNLV and what you do for self-care. And Galini, since I see your name first, I'll go with you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my apology. I'm in the car, so that's why I have my video <laughs> off, but I'm, I'm standing, so that's okay. <laughs> and I also lost my voice, so I have a little bit of that as well. So uh, I joined UNLV last year. I'm an assistant professor in uh, a business school, the business school. And uh, I joined last year. And for me, it wasn't only a first year. It was also a year that, you know, uh, it was difficult for UNLV as a whole. So it was uh, uh, many things that for me as a new faculty, um, you know, it's difficult to understand because, you know, there is, I don't know what normal is and with abnormal changes, you know, it's kind of, uh, it was a little bit difficult. So I'm still, I'm, and it was, it happened in our business school and my colleague, uh, a very close colleague, I really, uh, I worked with him. So he was, um, affected and, uh, um, it is, uh, it, it was difficult. It was difficult. So I took some time off in summer. So I'm trying to socialize and try to bring, uh, the faculty together. So, so we, as a new faculty, cause we had the four people, uh, that joined last year and a couple of them this year. So I will try to do as much as I can. I just joined the community, a diversity and inclusion committee. So I, I, um, uh, so I will, uh, uh, try to make sure that you know, we come closer together, especially the new faculty, six of us. It's almost like a, at least third of the of the department, not third of the department, but quarter maybe. Uh, so, so that's what I do, and uh, this is how I cope by by uh, uh, getting closer with people and sharing and discussing and you know trying to focus on on university, trying to focus on others, trying to focus on our major um, you know, things that we need to do. Uh, thank you, Galini. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Nicole? 
Thank Hello, you. everyone. I'm Nicole Hudson. I am the um, I've been with UNLV for five years. And what I do for self care, I dabble in a lot of things. I just recently took up golf. I kind of okay. like it. Kind of like it. Call me. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> I look the part, but I don't play the part. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. The skirts are great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Marrero. I've been at UNLV for about 15 years, plus some, because it's hard to remember all the years. Um, but uh, for self-care, I love to read or just you know get my nails done, get my hair done, get a massage, just completely disconnect from everything and everybody and just focus on me. Very good. Uh, Barbara? Uh, I'm Barbara Sanders. I am an investigator with the Office of Equal Employment, Title IX. I've been at UNLV for just about five years now. However, I've been with NCHI since 2000. So I've been here a while, but I retired and came back to work. I took a break. And um, during the break, I was doing what would you might consider self-care. And that was um, I was playing grandma to my grandson that was here and there was a new one on the way. So I played grandma for a while. Okay. And then I realized when I knew all the characters in Paw Patrol, along with the themes and the plots, I needed to do something else. And so that was this was the job. And for self-care, I do things to take care of me, the mani pedis, the massage. Mm -hmm. uh, taking naps and don't get me started on some good beat them up, shoot them up, cover, cut them up, vampire, werewolf, whatever. Come on TV. Just finished with watching with my daughter, my son-in-law, the whole alien series in the context in which it was supposed to have come out. Although it didn't, it started with Sigourney Weaver and it was like, Oh, well now this makes sense. So I do what I can to, I, I just do me as my self-care. And I don't worry about like it, don't like it, it's me. It's All right. 100%. That's the way it's supposed to be, Miss Barbara. Yes, indeed. Nayeli, and if I did not pronounce that right, please let me know. Oh, oh, no, you did great. Um, hi, okay. my name is Nayeli Rico Lopez. I um, am the coordinator for the Undocumented Student Program um, as part of the Office of the Intersection. Um, and I have been at UNLV for three years already. Um, and uh, I'm I actually a, a graduate from a, an entry institution. Um, so I think I've been with working with the institution for a bit longer since 2017 as a student worker. Um, and I'm really happy to have joined the UNLV uh, fam, specifically the intersection fam. Um, I think we do awesome stuff. Uh, but I think a part of uh, my self-care is uh, making sure I'm surrounding myself with uh, friends and loved ones. Um, I think those support systems for me are very um vital in just re-energizing myself. Um, and uh, so I, I love to do that. And I also love to go get my uh, manicures and um, and go uh, get haircuts and my hair washed and, you know, all of that good stuff as well. Um, so just, you know, pamper, pamper myself. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Nayeli. Uh, Dr. Langston? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Am I unmuted? I uh, know you we can hear you. Can you tell uh can you uh tell us how long you've been with UNLV and what you do for self-care? 53 years I've been at UNLV. All right, let's just give a I mean, come on. I just saw an article on you, Dr. Langston, about you being at UNLV for the, so long. Yes. At my age and time in my life. I do whatever I feel like doing when okay, I want to do it. Okay, come with it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you say suits you are my, <laughs> Whatever suits me. I My favorite thing to do is travel. I love to travel. Okay. So I try to travel and, and I do all of those other nice things you ladies say you do for yourselves as well. I have now learned that I can do nothing and I'm not being idle and in the devil's workshop. Well, okay, all right. All right. So there's some lessons right there from Dr. Langston. Thank you for sharing. And Dr. Uh, Barlow, would you like to tell us how long you work for UNLV and what you do for self-care? So I have uh, been at UNLV for 27 years. 
And in terms of self-care or relaxation, I can say I don't do enough of either. Uh, okay. My mind always seems to be racing. However, when I do get a chance to kind of chill out, then I do enjoy some guilty pleasures like watching um, Ratchet TV, like Basketball Wives. That's, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know how I got into that, but Basketball Wives. And then, and then certainly some other uh, shows that I do like to binge watch. You know, like well, this is it. a judgment-free zone, so we will not judge you for your trash TV. That's okay. Yeah, it is trash. Uh, I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Um, all of that is important. And the reason we ask you that is that it's really important that we have self-care relaxation. I tell people, um, I, I never achieved work-life balance until I retired and I preached it. I supported it in others, but I never achieved it myself. So I, it's really important that we understand that you cannot take care of others until you take care of yourself. So we want to watch this uh, short video. It's about five minutes, but I really felt like this video captured the essence of what we're talking about today and really put resilience in the whole, no the whole notion of being resilient in context. So hopefully, and I know I have to share my sound. Give me one second. I'll make sure I click that. Your computer sound. Okay. Let's listen to this. We think of a great leader as the unwavering captain who guides us forward through challenge and complexity. Confident, unwavering leaders armed with data and past experience have long been celebrated in business and politics alike. But sometimes, and certainly now, a crisis comes along that is so new and so urgent that it upends everything we thought we knew. One thing we know for sure is that more upheavals are coming. In a completely interconnected world, a single political uprising, a viral video, a distant tsunami, or a tiny virus can send shockwaves around the world. Upheaval creates fear, and in the midst of it, people crave security, which can incline leaders toward the usual tropes of strength, confidence, constancy, but it won't work. We have to flip the leadership playbook. First, this type of leadership requires communicating with transparency, communicating often. So how can leaders lead when there is so little certainty, so little clarity? Whether you are a CEO, a prime minister, a middle manager, or even a head of school, upheaval means you have to ramp up the humility. When what you know is limited, pretending that you have the answers isn't helpful. Amidst upheaval, Leaders must share what they know and admit what they don't know. Paradoxically, that honesty creates more psychological safety for people, not less. For example, when the pandemic devastated the airline industry virtually overnight, CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian, ramped up employee communication, despite having so little clarity about the path ahead. Facing truly dire results, at one point in 2020, losing over $100 million a day, it would have been far easier for Bastian to wait for more information before taking action. But effective leaders during upheaval don't hide in the shadows. In fact, as Bastian put it, it is far more important to communicate when you don't have the answers than when you do. Second, act with urgency despite incomplete information. Admitting you don't have the answers does not mean avoiding action. While it's natural to want more information, Fast action is often the only way to get more information. Worse, inaction leaves people feeling lost and unstable. When New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern laid out a four-level alert system very early in the COVID-19 crisis, she lacked information with which to set the level. Despite lacking answers, she did not wait to communicate about the threat with the nation. At first, she set the level at two, only to change it to four two days later as cases rose. That triggered a national lockdown, which no doubt saved countless lives. Later, when cases began to dissipate, she made subsequent decisions reflecting that new information. 
Third, leaders must hold purpose and values steady, even as goals and situations change. Values can be your guiding light when everything else is up in the air. If you care about customer experience, don't let go of that in times of upheaval. If a core value is health and safety, put that at the center of every decision you make. Now, doing this requires being very transparent about what your values are. And in this way, your steadfastness shows not in your plans, but in your values. Prime Minister Erdogan's clear purpose all along was protecting human life. Even as the immediate goal shifted from preventing illness to preparing health systems and ultimately to bolstering the economy. And finally, give power away. Our instincts are to hold even more tightly to control in times of upheaval, but it backfires. One of the most effective ways to show leadership, if counterintuitive, is to share power with those around you. Doing this requires asking for help, being clear that you can't do it alone. This also provokes innovation while giving people a sense of meaning. Nothing is worse in a crisis than feeling like there's nothing you can do to help. We follow this new kind of leader through upheaval because we have confidence, not in their map, but in their compass. We believe they've chosen the right direction given the current information and that they will keep updating. Most of all, we trust them and we want to help them in finding and refinding the path forward. So what did you think about that? That was a shift, right? From what we, how we normally approach things. Any immediate reactions to that? Well, I have always promoted working in that kind of manner. And it was very difficult for people around me and working with one VP at the time said, Barbara, you are making us all look bad. I said, then do better because I couldn't change and not willing to change who I am because it was working and working effectively. And I knew that based upon the responses I was getting from those that I was working with. Yeah, absolutely. Someone else? Yeah, I um, particularly uh, held on to the part that she's talking about being honest, right? You absolutely. know, even if you That's don't right. know, is to Stay be honest, that. right? You know, and, and just how important that is and to, to work as transparently as you can. And then mm -hmm. obviously then, then not being afraid to delegate the, that power or to, to give that power away. And I think that oftentimes as you're going up that leadership rung, right, you get a little, you feel some kind of way about giving <laughs> up that power. But after a minute, sure. you realize that, hey, you know, even that's a powerful moment. Even that's a powerful thing to be able to give that up and to give that opportunity to someone else. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, Crystal and I were talking about the video because obviously, both, like most of us, we kind of lived through it with our organizations. Um, you know, in 2008, when we had the the foreclosure crisis, remember, we were the last to, to actually get to the foreclosure crisis. But then we, when we got there, we led the nation. And um, I remember trying to figure out what we needed to do, not knowing. First of all, I didn't even, you know, how many of y'all really read your mortgage documentation, right? I'm all in the closet looking for mine with dust and everything. I'm like, let me look at my own documents, right? But there was so much we didn't know. And we just needed to come out and say, we didn't know. And not only did we not know, but it, it became so complicated in so many people, you know, we had over a hundred thousand uh, people in our community lost their homes. And, and that was huge, right? And so the communicating with certainty and often when we hit the pandemic, I didn't know, you know, the term pandemic, I really hadn't heard that term much. Most of us hadn't. Uh, we were called, I remember being called on a Sunday night uh, at home and was told, hey, they're going to close the schools tomorrow and we need you and your team to be on the ground. I didn't, I was like, okay, on the ground. I don't know what this even means, but all right, we're going to be ready. Um, and there was so much going on, so much stress, so much uncertainty, so much misinformation that 
you know, but we needed to communicate. The employees were looking at us as leadership saying, hey, what are you going to do? And I remember us being in, in uh, our closed door setting and talking with one another because we really didn't know. We didn't know what the pandemic was. We didn't know how it was spread. We didn't, there was just so much we didn't know. But we were like, we have to put out consistent messages based on the information we have. And we said that, like, this is the information we have right now. So and here's the source of where we're getting that information from. And we will continue to communicate. And we did that. We pushed out notifications. We, you know, we had uh, team meetings. We were on the ground. We were doing that. But the other thing is we were very transparent. All of us were also concerned. You know, I think oftentimes you try to put up a, a stern exterior to pretend like it doesn't bother us. It bothered me. I had elderly parents at home. I needed to protect them, but I also had a job to do where it required me to be in the field. Um, I had children at home. Uh, they didn't, they had no school. They were at home. They were living their best life and I was living my worst life because mm -hmm. they were like, this is fantastic. No, it is not fantastic. I don't know what you're doing all day. Uh, but those are some of the things and we had to, we needed to share that. And that really brought the team together when we could say, I understand you have children. If you need to do take care of your kids and then come back in, you know, we'll work around that because I had the teams that were working on the front line. And then the ask for help. One of the things I learned through um, all of the different, the pandemic, the economic downturn, one October, is that people have more capacity and more expertise than we give them credit for. Oftentimes we are confined and bound by our job description, but most people have come with other experiences. They have lived lives and we don't know. And I saw people do remarkable things during those times that we probably wouldn't have even known that they were capable of if we just said, oh, you're a management analyst or you are an administrative assistant or you're just a professor. No, we are more than just the the title that we carry right now. And if we don't ask for help and if we don't, you know, share that power, we are missing out on the opportunity for others to help us in those moments. And so I, I would really, really encourage us to rethink how we approach those things. Like, you know, by talking about it now, if we ever need it, we would know, okay, how do we be more inclusive with that? But I had amazing team members that stepped up to the plate and did things I didn't even know that were that they were capable of and and yet had they not have done it had i not have asked for help had i not have been transparent saying i don't know what to do but we're going to figure it out as a team we wouldn't have been as successful as we were uh during that pandemic i don't know how to get this thing okay i'm sorry and if i could just add to that too please because um, it resonates so strongly in our area is the empowerment of saying, I don't know, and the openness and transparency of providing that collaborative space. So yes. together, how can we move forward? What is it that we all need who are here right now? How can we get through this next hour, this next day for our own team? And I think when we experienced that in December 6th, particularly that our boss, Dr. Barlow, was extremely open with all of us, allowing us to say, okay, we don't know. We've never been through this. Okay. Let's, you know, what is it that we need individually? What is it that we can do to support each other individually and as a group? And seeing that was so helpful because it allowed us to then model good behavior. And so I was able to do that with my other students. My students have been able to do that with themselves in their peer mentoring groups to be transparent and acknowledge, I don't have the answer. I don't know, but how can we work through it? And I had never heard that message before. It was always, you're in this job, in this role, you were hired to be the answer person, you know? And so that whole perspective change that you're bringing, that you're having us talk about is so critical and crucial. So thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And Anna, you're, you're spot on. You know, being resilient means that we shouldn't be confined to the box. I mean, let's just think about that for a second. You know, when we just said, how do you navigate uncertainty? If it's uncertain, that means that how you navigate, you may not know how you're going to navigate until you get there. You know, December 6th was an absolute 
tragic time in our community for the the UNLV community and our community it brought. I mean, we all, you know, we'd already been through one October and we thought, oh my gosh, how could that happen here? And then I remember on December 6th, because being um, a faculty, I was getting the notifications. I started, I mean, you know, I'm calling, I'm texting Dr. Barlow. I know she's overwhelmed at the time. Like, thank y'all for caring about me. But then that's enough. No more text messages. Um, and, you know, my niece is there on campus. My got kids are on campus and all of that. And and there was so much we didn't know about what was going on. All we could just see is what, what, what was being um, shown on the news. And again, how, as much as we try to prepare for these things, right? Because we do active shooter. I, we've been a part of those active shooter drills and all that sort of stuff. But it's the difference when it actually happens. And then how do you support, you know, the you you're you got to take care of yourself but then you're like okay we've got these students that we have to take care of we've got uh employees that we have to take care of and all these other folks and that put those you into a different state of mind and it also says that it's not just incumbent upon the uh university president but all of us have a role in how we can recover and part of that starts with the acknowledgement one thing I wish we had done better when we did dealt with the pandemic is that when the pandemic was quote unquote over or when we were going to reopen, it was just like flip, flipping on a light switch. Okay, tomorrow everybody's coming back in the office or tomorrow everybody's going to go back to their roles. But there really wasn't a lot of acknowledgement around, hey, thank you for doing a job that you didn't sign up for. Thank you for being out there caring for the homeless because we set up a field hospital and none of y'all are medical people, personnel, but you stayed at that field hospital and you work 12 hour shifts. We didn't do enough of that. Thank you. You know, we didn't acknowledge the fact that many of our employees, some of them came close to death themselves because of the, the COVID virus. Some of them lost family members during the time and that we could have done a better job with that acknowledgement. So part of us being resilient is not just making it through, but what you do after matters how we continue to build people up, how we continue to help people move forward matters. And we have to stop. And it can't just be business as usual because we just came through something that we have already acknowledged is, was insurmountable. Like we just said, it's uncertainty. And yet sometimes when we recover, we want to make sure that we at least acknowledge that people went through something extremely difficult. So what does resilience mean to you? Now that we've kind of looked at that video and what you what you thought when you first um, came today, what does it mean to you? Oh, I get it. Okay. Sorry. I think it's an ability to bounce back and thrive. You know, mm -hmm. part of it is to come back, but then to move forward. I think that's what I think about. Thank you, Nicole. So Nicole said it's the ability not only to come back, but also how do you can move forward? How do we continue on? Okay. Barbara? And for me, it would say, you're not going to break. You're going to be all right. Just keep on keeping on. Do a little better here. Do this. But keep it up. You're not going to break. You're not porcelain. Yeah. Others? My favorite quote is, it's it's the comma in the sentence is not the period. Yeah. Yeah. All of all of those definitions um, are accurate. You know, it's it is the ability to recover quickly from change. It's the ability to go through change, not really knowing what's going to happen on the other side, but being able to continue on. Right. And there, and we know from some of the things that we've talked about already today that within that resilience, there's a psychological resilience, right? Um, there's an impact there. I don't know about y'all, but you know, after going through that pandemic, I never it, there is like a fundamental change, and I even saw it in my kids. At first, I mean, I worked uh, at, at work for all of their lives, and as soon as the pandemic hit and we came out of it, every day they were asking me, "Are you going to work?" Are you, I'm like, I've been working. What are we talking about? But because I was working more hybrid and they had got accustomed because my kids were at home for 18 months. OK, talk about resilience. I needed some psychological resilience after that. I said, oh, God bless the teachers. Um, <laughs> it was incredible. 
But, you know, that it was there was like psychologically that something changed in them about me leaving the house. They, they were they, they they didn't uh, they all of a sudden now didn't have comfort there emotionally, um, you know, emotional resilience. The impact of the trauma. Right. Because a lot oftentimes when we go through these things, there is a emotional trauma that happens, right? How do we heal from that? A lot of you guys said, hey, I get massages, I meditate, I do all those different things. How do we heal ourselves emotionally? And then individually, what do we need to do to move forward? For some people, they have to learn a new skill, right? If the, if the business closed or if their job was eliminated, they have to learn a new skill. They have to do some individual development. So all of those, those types of uh, things matter in resilience and how quickly one can recover. So well, this is one of my favorite um, charts to use when we're talking about resilience, because it's really about the circle of influence back one slide from release. So when we talk about the circles of influence, and this one has been updated so that it includes the circle of um, adapt, there's a huge circle for concern, right? There's a lot of things that we're concerned about, but these areas are truly outside of your control and your influence as well. We focus on what we should be focusing on is the circle of control. Those are things that we have the direct influence over and that we can actually control. I know for myself, I spend a lot of time in the circle of concern. I'm worried about everything. Things that like I make up stuff. If, you know, if, if a coworker <laughs> isn't at work at their normal time, you know what happened? They rolled over there in a car accident, they're in a ditch. That's not really what happened, right? But in my circle, is, is that something I need to be concerned about? Oh, well, Rick had a doctor's appointment this morning. That's why he's not here. Mind your business to get to work, right? But there's a lot in that circle of concern that we just, there's nothing we can do about it. Then we have the circle of influence. And there is where I spend a, a great amount of time as well, because even though it's not in my span of control, do I have a way to positively influence what I'm seeing? And those are things that we can do. It's conversations. It's saying, hey, I don't know, but if I talk to you and we can partner, maybe we can figure it out together. I think that all too often we, figure, we feel like we have to know the answer for everything. And then that's just not the reality of what it is. And that's not being resilient either. Being resilient is waking up and saying, I don't know, but I'm here and I'm willing to give it a try. Will you partner with me? And can we go through this together? Because oftentimes, to, to Lisa's point, we don't know the skill set that people come with. We know what we hired you for it. And you're doing a phenomenal job at that, but you came with some skill sets. And so we should really capitalize on that. Adaptability has to be one of the most important things that we look at when we talk about resilience. And that's why they added it to the circle of influence. When we talk about adapting, it really emphasizes the importance of being flexible and adjusting to the changes as they come. One of the things that we know, we just were in um, Montana and we went to Yellowstone. And, and, and one of the things that they said is the only constant is change. That's the only thing that will const is, is constant, right? We know things are going to change. It's how we adapt to those that will help us get through to the next thing. It, everything has an ebb and a flow, and we just have to remind ourselves of that. Next slide, please. So it brings me to the point of why are we discussing resilience in higher education? Um, any thoughts about why would we be talking about this why would Dr. Barlow say this is important? Why do you, I know you all know that this is important. Why are we talking about resilience in higher education? I think it's because on a daily, we're we're going through so much and we have 30,000 students that we are responsible for and, a, you know, five, 10,000 faculty and staff and we don't discuss resilience at mm -hmm. all. It's like, you have a job, go do it. Business is normal, you know, and it's it's frustrating and it's angry because that we don't we're not given the time space or vocabulary to cover any of this. You're absolutely right. You know it's 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 the status quo or and and this is the norm. This is not the norm. We are all experiencing things that you know. If my 83 year old or 89 year old father were still here, he would say, "I didn't think we'd see this again in my lifetime." So we're, it's cyclical, but it's things that we haven't dealt with, right? And then you have the students who are coming up and they're, they are a different generation. First of all, let me thank all of you because our two little mini-me's are on campus um, at UNLV and it's been a great experience for them. So thank you for taking good care of them. But it's things that these kids, they just say what they want to say. 
Um, and they have an opinion about everything. And why shouldn't you listen to me? Stop and listen to what I have to say. And so when we look at some of the challenges that I heard Dr. Barlow list uh, this morning, budget cuts huge. Um, enrollment fluctuations can impact you. Uh, technology changes. Even, I know it is impacting higher ed because it's impacting HR. We now have seminars where we're talking about how do we utilize AI in a way that can be beneficial, but also so that we understand how powerful the tool can be and what can happen if it is not used in the right way. So it's important that we really look at how can we deal with the things that are coming at us, but in a healthy way? Because if we don't deal with them in a healthy way, we are guaranteed to experience burnout. You can't go any further. Even though you mentally think you can, your body will start to shut down on you. Stress, um, if you're not processing it in the proper way, we don't have to be, we can be resilient, but we can also be resilient in a healthier way. And so let's talk about what that looks like for us. Chris, I can I can attest that during the pandemic, I uh, thought I had bed bugs, which I wasn't sure how I would get bed bugs. But there again, that was my my mind running. Mm -hmm. But I actually had broken out in hives. And it was just literally the stress of trying to be all things at work and then also trying to make sure that my family was safe. You know, when you walk into a grocery store and you don't see food on the shelves, that was something that was I'd never seen before. And I didn't realize it until my, as Crystal said, obviously I wasn't doing my self-care then, but I woke up with hives and it was, it was pretty frightening for me. It was actually comical because you really thought you had bed bugs. <laughs> so here's some personal strategies that I want to talk about when we, we you know, everybody listed self-care, right? And you talked about the things that you do for self-care, but when you're at work and you can't get away to get the manicure or get your hair done or to go golfing or to travel, what is it that you're doing in that space that allows you to recover? And for me, I'll ju just tell you what I've, what I've done. Um, I love you too. I found some meditation music and there's like five minute meditations. I've got calm on my, on my cell phone. I take a minute. I give myself the time necessary to take a minute and breathe. Um, there's times when I just get up and I walk around the building. Not when it's hot like this, it's dangerous, but when it cools down in the fall and you can actually get out there and take a little walk, take a walk, just clear your mind, give yourself the time. Breathing exercises work. Um, we do a lot of work now um, with mindfulness. And so we've gotten sound baths for our employees. We did a 30 minute sound bath. First time we had ever done something like that. Uh, and it was so relaxing, I fell asleep. And so did some of my other colleagues, but it was necessary. And the, the weight that was lifted, we started lunchtime meditations after the pandemic because people just need to take a break. So what I would encourage you to do is Create a space where you're able to do that for yourselves because sometimes you can't get away and get the manicure. Sometimes you can't stop and do things, but let's create a space where you're able to have that type of break that's necessary to continue to work. Um, building a network is super important. One of the things that uh, my sister and I have done for each other is we've become accountability partners. And as Lisa has said, she just works, works I mean, I don't know when she sleeps. I used to take enough naps for the both of us, but she has a huge workload. So it became necessary for me to be her accountability partner to say, hey, you said that you were going to retire. And yes, you've got all these amazing offers coming, but take the break. Take the break necessary so that you can get back into the game. And she'll do the same thing for me. Hey, you said you were going to study for that exam. Have you started? What are you doing? Accountability partners are so very vital that I would encourage you to make certain that you have an accountability partner if you don't. Um, because sometimes we just need somebody to tap us on our shoulder and say, hey, that you're doing too much. Hey, make certain that you're prioritizing your self-care. You talk about work-life balance, but I don't see you exhibiting it. So we need those things. The other thing I think about um, is adaptive leadership. That's just being flexible. Things are going to come our way. And leadership, by the way, of whatever chair you sit in, you are a leader in your own right. Doesn't matter. I know we're title focused, but sometimes when we talk about that, that influence, the circle of influence, you have more influence than a leader does based upon how you show up. So make certain that you are flexible in that way. And then I always like to say continuous learning and development. I think it's important to make certain that you never stop learning. 
um, that also helps build your resilience in times of uncertainty. Uh, I've made it a commitment to the entire staff that I have, and I'm currently constantly preaching, you need to make certain that you have a learning goal. You should always become a continuous learner. And being in higher ed, I know that this is something that is something that you all probably always do. And if not, what's your learning goal for the year? And it could be something random. It doesn't have to be attached to the job. This year, my sister and I decided we want to learn how to speak Spanish better. So we're taking Spanish courses two times a week. I'm beating her, but that's okay. We're going to get better at this. So when we talk about applying resilience to your daily lives, again, just to reiterate, um, start with a positive mindset. This was huge for me. Coming out of the pandemic, um, going back into work, not having a break really because I worked the entire pandemic. On top of that, um, I felt like the pandemic had robbed me of time with my dad, who at this point had began to get a little bit sicker. And so although I thought I was holding it together extremely well, um, it took some ac accountability partner to say, hey, you are very angry. And I was like, no, I'm not angry. I'm just doing my job. I'm good. And it was very much, you're, you're very angry and we need you to process that. So what did I do? I went to Amazon because it makes me happy. And I bought a gratitude journal. So I started my day every day with what am I thankful for? I'm thankful that I had 89 years with my dad. Or I didn't have 89. I'm, I'm only 47. So you understand what I'm saying. I'm happy with the time that I had with my father. And I needed to really focus on that instead of the time that I didn't have, the time that I was robbed with COVID, but, but I still was able to do things with him. And so I had to focus on that. Prioritize your task. If, if you don't have a list, um, I heard Dr. Barlow say her brain never stops. One of my best friends is this right here. It's just a journal, right? I got a journal and I have it on my nightstand because when that thought pops in, I don't want to lose it because I won't remember it in the morning. So I just jot it down. And that way I put it somewhere and I can get back to relaxing, right? Again, take the time necessary to have breaks and to recharge yourself. That's how you maintain your resilience. It is creating a habit of making certain that you're doing the thing necessary to feed your soul. All right, so what I'd like to have you all do is just take a few minutes to reflect on some of the strategies that we've come up with today and that we've talked about and just draft a personal action plan, something small, just one thing, either personal or professional that you can do that will help you build and maintain your resilience. Let's take like two minutes to do that. And then once you have that, anyone who would like to share, just unmute yourself and tell us what you're what you're going to commit to as a part of your personal uh, or your action plan. This is Barbara, and part of my action plan that I'm going to work on is that when I say I work from home right now, so when I say I'm going to knock off my day ends at five o'clock, mm -hmm. I am going to shoot for starting to shut down at four. So that by five, I'll walk away. And since I know I'm a work in progress, I'm going to try for three out of five days in the week to do that. That's a great goal. That's a great goal, Barbara. Start small. I always say take baby steps, right? Yep. We always tend to think, oh, we should just do it really big. No, don't do it big. Do it consistently and do it in a smaller bites until you can get to the big, right? Yep. That's a great one. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. I can share. Um... Nayeli again. Um, I think for myself, I put down two pieces for my plan. Um, 
first is to listen to my accountability partners, which I think unofficially it has been Dr. M and Dr. Barlow. Mm -hmm. um, and they're always like, you're doing a lot. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And then I get to the point where it's like happening and I'm like, this is too much. And so I end up overextending myself, but they mm -hmm. like see it a mile away before it happens. But usually I'm like very eager to just like be doing all the things. So I think for myself is listening to them, right? To those indicators when they're they're pointing out like, okay, you have a lot going on, maybe reconsider. They, they say it in a much nicer way, but <laughs> um, in a much low, low key way, but um. I, I I can pick up on those things now, um, three years in. <laughs> um, and the other part, I think, is also just respecting my personal boundaries. Um, for example, like the leaving on time right at five o'clock um, and uh, giving myself grace with um, not uh, booking my days too tightly. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, things that will allow for a more productive day and not having, ending up, ending with me feeling overwhelmed um I yeah yeah I think that's huge right um knowing you know respecting the boundaries that you've set um this after COVID pr prior to COVID I would take my work phone on vacation with me I was at a vacation you got your work phone and you're answering emails something is not going right with you today right and so I stopped taking that work phone and I stopped checking my emails because the reality is Whatever it is, someone else can figure it out. And then in kind, I do the same thing when they go on vacation. Don't take your phone with you. I got it. I'm not going to make too much of a mess. Nothing. It's not, you know, we're not in a medical field where it's life altering. This isn't what we're doing. This is HR, right? So I'm just going to tell you that I tried my best. Sorry, I messed that up for you, but you didn't have to worry about it while you were on vacation, right? So it's really important that we set boundaries and that we create that healthy work-life balance. I used to feel guilty for leaving work on time. I don't feel guilty anymore because I've done a full day's worth of work and I've given it my all. And now I'm going to go home and I'm going to be super mom. In my mind, I'm super mom to these kids. They might think I'm a dork. I don't know. But that's what I'm going to go do. Right. So I really created that separation so that I don't feel guilty when I leave work. And I'm also not taking on more than I more than I should. Yeah. And, you know, this is an American problem because we have been um, taught that. Oh, you just got to work yourself to the bone or whatever. And honestly, in like in my career, we used to go get a physical exam out of California every two years to make sure we were um, healthy and all that sort of stuff because of the high stress job. And I remember my best friend saying, well, that's crazy. So instead of just reducing the stress or having a better balance, we're just going to address it when you have the issue. And I, and that honestly, I didn't have that aha moment until the until she said that. I thought, oh, I used to sell back my time because I couldn't take enough time. Uh, and we had a use it or lose it policy. I mean, we would cap out at, on your vacation leave. And I thought, well, you know what? Um, that is probably not healthy. And I saw a lot of people during my tenure that had heart attacks and strokes and other types of, you know, illnesses because we don't take care of ourselves. And that's a part of it. And there's always, unfortunately, going to be some next thing that we're going to have to worry about. But in, but we also have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Would anyone else like to share? I really like the, um, the suggestion of having a notepad by the bed to empty your head. Yes. Of all those things, because mine always happen in the shower. So I come into the office the next day and bother Dr. B. It's like, I got a shower thought. I don't know if it's yes. real a good one, but <laughs> it happened while I was in the shower. And, you know, I'll, I'll word vomit it. But I want to adapt that one. And like Barb, maybe three days a week, have a list at my desk of emptying it before I go at four o'clock of everything that is work. So that when... 4 30 comes around I'm ready to leave and everything is in this notebook even if it's a fleeting thought or a random thought or something that I need to get to so I don't take that with me and have it stew with me until I come back absolutely that's awesome man I love it mm -hmm. thank you well, we want to be respectful of your time and we know how much time Dr. B has given us so um are there any questions, any comments that you'd like to share about what we've shared with you this, this morning? 
I usually refer to these meetings as my chicken soup for the soul. And again, this has lived up to that. And it was, it's, it's a great way for me to relax. And I really enjoy it. And this was a, it was a great relaxation event. Resiliency event. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, I just want to thank you both for, uh, you know, agreeing to, to be here this morning and to, to facilitate this session. Um, I knew we needed it, and but I don't think that I really realized how much we needed it and certainly how much I needed it, right? You know, um, we end up putting so much on ourselves, right, because we we feel like or think that that's what we're supposed to do, you know, but we have to take that time to regroup, reevaluate and breathe. And as a matter of fact, that's what I wrote is that I'm going to take the time to breathe because I don't think that I really get a chance to do that. So, as I said, I just really, really want to thank you both for, for uh, doing this uh, for us this morning. Um, really and truly appreciate it. Um, we've uh, got two additional sessions that we'll be looking at for the, this semester uh, surrounding this topic. Uh, for faculty, um, we have uh, David Hatchett coming in who's going to be talking about the Faculty Opportunity Awards Program. And then for the November program, will be facilitated by Beth Berry and Blanca Ricone and Harun St uh, Stephen, who will be talking about what does it look like to build capacity for serving our students in teaching. Um, so I just really, uh, Crystal, Lisa, thank you all so, so very much. I'll make sure that you have the, the video. I'll let it uh, give it to you once it gets processed. And thank you all uh, for coming and kicking off the Fall 24 Professor Circle. Appreciate thank it. You. All right. Thank all you. Right. Take care thank all. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Great day. That was awesome. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>